Well, hello, welcome to the video. We're going to take another dive into forgotten music history. This time, we're looking at five bands from the 1980s who had the potential to be huge, but who sadly vanished without trace. Now, I've been around, as you probably know, since the early 1970s in the music business, so I do know what I'm talking about. I'm going to tell you some personal insights to these bands that no one else will be able to tell you. Stick around, because who knows, you may find your new favourite band. we're going to talk about is the sound. Now the sound were fronted by Adrian Borland and came from southwest London, Kingston, Wimbledon, that sort of area. And Adrian Borland was like a one-off. They were certainly an unsung band at the time, although their albums kept getting five stars in the music press. No one seemed to buy them. And I don't know what happened, but their strategy didn't seem to pay off. And they never really hit the heights they deserved. To my mind, they pick up where Joy Division ended. It's like an extension of that. I only saw them play live once. I was mesmerized by Adrian Borland, frankly, and every word he sang, every note he played, felt as if it came from his heart and stabbed you deep into yours. I know that sounds a bit dramatic, but it was pretty special. But, as I say, they never actually got anywhere due to the various problems. The record label let them down, some say. I think their strategy was wrong. They basically toured with other bands as a support. They were always playing to somebody else's fans. If you want a real treat, check out their 1981, I think it was, album, From the Lion's Mouth. That is fantastic. Unfortunately, Adrian Borland took his own life on the early hours of April 26, 1999, when he jumped under an express train at Wimbledon station. I catch your eyes. Well, who's next, you may be asking. Are you asking who's next? Well, I am, and it's the teardrop explodes. The name comes from a caption in a Marvel comic that frontman and bassist Julian Cope saw. The teardrop explodes. Very good, though. And they came from Liverpool. They were, as I say, led by a guy called Julian Cope. There were a lot more members of the band. We're letting that go into that. And they had a really big single success with Reward in 1981. But strangely, that wasn't from their first album, which is called Kilimanjaro. It was a collaboration of all the members of the band. Their second album, Wilder, one rock critic called it the most beautiful suicide note in history. Every song was written by Julian Cope and it went over the breakup of his marriage. It was all very personal and pretty gloomy and it was very experimental and it wasn't really the same sound that they were known for. People left, were pushed out. Their manager, for some reason, decided he wanted to write songs, things like that. And so what happened was, by the time they went to record their third album, which was in Rockfield Studios in Wales, Julian Cope walked out halfway through, leaving half the tracks without vocals. As far as he concerned, he'd left the band. But unfortunately, they were contracted to do one final British tour, which they did without a guitar, but with a synthesizer. And Julian Cope made it plain on stage he didn't want to be there. To those who went, who I know, said it was like watching a long car crash. He stopped singing halfway through some songs and things like that. The minute it was over, teardrop explodes, exploded. And Julian Cope went off to do his own thing. I had a thing where I tried to book him for my rhythm festival, which held in Bedfordshire, and the complexity of trying to get him to do a show, and so I basically lost interest in booking Julian Cope. Now, that may just have been his agent, or it may have been him. I don't know. So who cares, anyway? 
Does it matter? It's all history, this. And by the way, if you like what I'm doing, like this video. If you don't like it, well, you know, don't do anything, really. But if you want to subscribe and see more and help me along, because it would help me if you're not subscribed and you did subscribe and press the notification bell and share my videos. If you know somebody who you think might want to know about this bunker I do, then share it. And anyway, without further ado, I keep saying that. Don't, I've, said, I've said that more than once, I have. Maybe I can cut it out in the edit, who knows? But the next one we'll go about is the doctor's children. Now this was a band that not many people will have heard of. They were one of my favourite bands when I was at the Cricket Desert Kennington Oval back in the 1980s. They were led by a guy called Paul Smith, he was the main songwriter, and they just had these great great songs. They had a good following. It was a, I would say, a cult following. And it was one of those bands where every time they put out an EP or did something, we all thought, oh, they're going to be huge now. But it never actually happened. And then at one stage, now my recollection is a bit hazy from the 1980s, but at one stage I do remember them putting out an EP, I think it was, called King Buffalo. And the next time they played, the band had changed from the Doctor's Children to be called King Buffalo. <laughs> exactly who was in the band but I know Paul Smith was obviously and they were great too but what happened who knows it's one of those mysteries they were good but someone up there didn't think they should make it big and they didn't and the next one I'm going to talk about is fire next time time were put on to me let's go back a bit I used to put on a guy called Wes McGee who was from Leicestershire I think in Texas where he went and where he played music he was regarded as one of the top songwriters in that area I see you in a red dress now I hear that old song people like Joe Ely and Butch Hancock and Jimmy Del Gilmore and he was in their sort of thing. And he would bring over people like that and they'd play with his band and I'd put them on at my various places. I used to put music, especially the cricketers and they used to do the Roby. So Wes McGee one day put me onto a band called Fire Next Time, which was a totally different band. They weren't a country rock band. You know, when I say country rock, think of the flying Burrito Brothers, don't think of Dolly Parton. But anyway, Fire Next Time were nothing like that. They, they were led by a guy called James Maddock, who was a very good songwriter, and they were from, I think they were from the same area, but I think he lived in Corby in North Hampshire at the time, which was a new town. And he had a very left-wing view of life, and this, and in the, don't forget in those days, it was Thatcher was the Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, and so it was all very right-wing, and it's like loads of money and stuff like that. And he was totally opposite to that and he was a very good songwriter and the band were great and they were starting to build up a following but for some reason they broke up or changed their name to something else and then I saw lost touch with them. This may be when we left these cricketers and then eventually James went to the States and he established himself there and he formed a band there. They had a top five hit in these States. Wood made an album called Songs from Stamford Hill and several of them were featured on the hit teen TV show Dawson's Creek, including one that became a big hit called Stay You. doing stuff in the States and he's quite a well-known singer-songwriter and that's James Maddock of Fire Next Time who used to play at the Cricketers all the time. Happy days. The last one I'm going to talk about is the Triffids which 
although they were from Australia, they did move to London, I think in 83. And I put them on at the Cricketers quite a few times. Now, they were very pleasant. David McComb was the main guy in the band, the songwriter, the singer. He was a very melancholy bloke, but I always got on fine with him. And even though they were disappointed at the new facilities we had at the Cricketers, because it was just a basic pub with a stage, small stage actually, with the toilets next to the stage, so people like the, you know. Very rudimentary on-off lights, and the, the PA was actually pretty good, because I always made sure the sound was good. But even though they kept playing there, and I think they enjoyed it, you could tell that they weren't really suited there. And the minute they got famous, which what happened was, I believe the NME in January, somewhere like 86 or something like that, put them on the front cover and said the year of the Triffid and sure enough they put out singles they put out albums their singles went in the minor end of the charts and things but they never really made it as big as they ought to do once they left the cricketers they played the college circuit which was dying by this time because don't forget as I said it before it was this was the era of money was tight if you didn't have any but if you had loads then you had loads of money and those are the days eh <laughs> and there were minor strikes and all sorts of things going on and everyone was on strike or not anyway this was the 1980s and it was a very strange time but we're very polarized politically a bit like now actually strange it may seem although then it seemed a lot simpler you were with the miners or you were with Thatcher I obviously was with the miners but anyway so it was a very strange time and they never quite made it they went back to Australia they broke up now David he had back problems and that led to him taking painkillers and stuff like that which led to mood swings and a pan well anyway he came to an untimely end, I'm afraid. The album I recommend is Born Sandy Devotional, which again, if you want to get the flavour of the Triffids, that's the one to go for. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. This is what the 1980s was like for me. These are five bands I think ought to have made it and would have made it if things had been slightly different. If only things had been different, eh? What would our lives be like now? But if you want to watch more like this, I've also done a video about the five worst bands of the 1980s. Check that one out. And thank you for watching. See you next time. Goodbye.